it's a sad reality that in the National Health Service, historically, it's taken 17 years from laboratory discovery to patient benefit. An unacceptable figure at the best of times and wholly unrealistic figure at the times of COVID. So the mission of MASK is to be a part of a system that's driving discovery through to patient benefit. In 2017, to further facilitate that, MASK merged with the Greater Manchester Academic Health Science Network that is supported by NHS England to create Health Innovation Manchester. And more recently, we've been joined by the NIHR Applied um, Clinical Research Group to increase our momentum. And we also have close relationship with the other NIHR academic facilities within Manchester, most notably the Biomedical Research Centre and the Patient Safety Translational Research Centre. So there's a one, like, a one Manchester approach to aligning all our efforts into accelerating research through to patient benefit and importantly for Greater Manchester, attracting government and commercial investment into the biomedical, bioscientific infrastructure within the city. This one Manchester approach has been vindicated by our recent success in redesignating redesignation by NIHR for a further period of five years. The news of our redesignation came through in April, which wasn't exactly a time for parties, cakes, aerosol generating candles or balloons. So in lieu of any other form of celebration, we decided to create this seminar series. And the ambition is to put the spotlight on some of the great clinical scientists that we have doing work in Manchester and let them speak to the scientific community, but beyond that community, to the, all those who are interested in understanding the science that underpins health innovation. We're going to start with three seminars, all COVID orientated, before taking a break for August. In the autumn, we're going to return and hopefully by then be allowed to speak about topics other than COVID. I would be delighted to receive suggestions of speakers or topics of interest if you want to make those through, through the same email address as for questions today, namely mask seminars at healthinnovationmanchester.com. So now to the main event. I'm delighted to be introducing Professor Tracy Hussle as our first speaker. Tracy obtained her first degree in Nottingham, her PhD at UCL in London, and then moved on to work at St Mary's Hospital, which is part of the Imperial Group in London. She progressed and rose rapidly, and in 2006 was given a personal, personal chair as the Professor of Inflammatory Disease. Manchester was very fortunate to recruit her in 2012, and she's now the director of the Lydia Becker Institute of Immunology and Inflammation and of the Manchester Collaborative Centre for Inflammation Research. It's something she would never have wished for, but COVID-19 and the understanding of its inflammatory response pose a challenge to all scientists, and it brings out the best in scientists. And one can see that in Tracy, in that she's very quickly redirected the efforts of her laboratory to focus on the lung and COVID. She's already published one opinion piece in The Lancet about potential therapy options, and has submitted data from her initial study. I think we're very fortunate that Tracy and her colleagues John Granger and Elizabeth Mann are going to give us insights into their work, try and paint the bigger picture, and then we'll have hopefully 20 minutes at the end for questions. So with that, I'm going to switch off my microphone and camera like everybody else and listen to and enjoy Tracy's presentation. <laughs> 
Whoops, wrong slide. Sorry, wait a moment. Okay, hopefully everyone can um, hear me. Um, thank you all very much um, for joining us. There's been a, a, an overwhelming response to this lecture and we're really grateful for the opportunity to share our data with you. Um, I guess the first thing is, why did we jump so quickly onto COVID research in the first place? Um, it was driven by the fact that a lot of therapeutics were being uh, repurposed for the treatment of COVID um, at a time when we knew absolutely little about the pathogenesis of the disease. So we felt the urgent need to start collecting patient samples um, to analyze them in depth for the immunological profile. And we felt the need to do this on fresh tissue particularly, which I'll come back to a bit later about, about why that might be. Um, as Peter said, we have a data publication submitted to the Lancet um, at the moment, and we believe um, that what we found um, has significant clinical implications, which I'll talk about right at the end. But we're going to show you now what we've discovered, um, and I'm helped uh, very ably by John Granger and Elizabeth Mann, who are two absolutely key fellows in the Lydia Becker um, Institute, and they will be going through their sort of specialist data. To begin with, I wanted to put the lung into context and um, bring everyone sort of up to speed on the current concepts about lung immunity. The, um, the lungs, have very few immune cells, and that's necessary to um, allow it to perform it, it, its homeostatic functions. If you look in the air spaces, the dominant immune cells are your airway macrophages or alveolar macrophages. And you have about one or two of these per alveoli. And they have a really hard job to do because they not only have to inflame when they encounter a pathogen. They are also responsible for clearing up um, the debris of everyday life. So cellular turnover, dying cells, environmental particles. And in that respect, they don't want to inflame. And so they have this sort of collision of functions. They have to be able to inflame when there's a problem and they have to clear things away quietly, hoover things up, when it's your own um, cellular mess. And so we've been working for some time on how does the lung know or how does the alveolar macrophage know when to inflame and when to not inflame when it's ingesting foreign particles? And the answer is on this rather complicated slide, but I, there's a, a take home message on this is that your immune cells, we often think that immune cells are sat there and that when a foreign particle comes along, they burst into flames, throwing out cytokines and chemokines. But in fact, that's not the case. Your immune system, the default is to always be activated, but they are suppressed in health by an intact epithelial cell structure. So if the epithelium is intact, we've worked out lots of signals that stop that macrophage from becoming um, activated. So intact structure equals no inflammation, even if you have quite a lot of a pathogen or a foreign particle there, you need structural damage in order to release these mechanisms and allow inflammation to, to happen. So you have homeostasis and then along comes uh, coronavirus 2, which enters via the respiratory tract. This is like a snapshot of a, a sneeze. I wouldn't like to think that I actually produce quite so much of that uh, when I sneeze. But this is going to be an ongoing problem. We've had a number of uh, pandemics and epidemics over the past couple of decades. This is not going to go away. And the World Health Organization have basically said that we're going to have to learn to live with this and we're going to have to adapt to this just like we adapted to, to HIV. So we are constantly involving, evolving with our, with our microenvironment and we can't get rid of this. 
it's going to mutate with time every time it replicates it mu it mutates and so we really need to do something different to understand it this slide here is showing you the structure of coronaviruses in general they have genetic material on the inside in the form of RNA, and this actually acts like a messenger RNA when it gets inside the cell. It enters via this spike protein, which binds to the ACE2 receptors. And all the coronaviruses do that from MERS to SARS to the current uh, COVID-19 causing strain. And you'll notice that for MERS, we had outbreaks in 2012, 15, 18, for SARS, we had multiple outbreaks between 2002 and 2004, and now we have um, the current one, um, which is caused by SARS-CoV-2. But there are very different case fatality rates. So MERS, for example, only caused 858 deaths globally, even though it had a case fatality rate of 37%. This means that when this virus got in, it was highly damaging, even more damaging than the one we're facing now. But it didn't transmit very well, so it only affected a few people. It's the same with uh, the original SARS uh, coronavirus. Again, only 774 deaths, a slightly lower case fatality rate. It didn't transmit very well. What we're facing now is a virus that hasn't got a large case fatality rate, but it transmits really well. And so at the time of writing this slide, and this has changed, there have been 433,000 uh, deaths. So it's virulence of the organism, but what really drives the cell numbers is how easily it's transmitted from person to person. Now the immune system is very complicated and there's an innate immune part and an adaptive immune part. And every stage of the viral replication from um, its entry into the cell via this ACE2 receptor, all the way through with it replicating its genome and its viral proteins, all the way through to it being released to go on to infect other cells is recognized by the immune system. There are specific compartments that recognize the virus in this state and internally within the cell. Now, the thing with the immune response is, the immune response has to recognize this as a dangerous uh, process. Otherwise, you'd be responding to things all of the time. So in some cases, your immune system may start too slowly, which means the viral load will go up, and that by the time the immune system does kick in, you end up with a bigger immune system. Equally, it is just as important to stop um, um, the immune response as it is to start it. And in some cases, which we're learning a lot more now, the problem with inflammation is that it just simply hasn't stopped. Um, and so inflammatory pathology can occur because of a slow immune response or one that simply hasn't stopped. And the one that hasn't stopped goes on to give you your acute respiratory distress syndrome and your cytokine storm that John and Lizzie will talk about later. So what did we do um, uh, and how did we do it? We decided to start sampling patients on admission to hospital and then at every time point thereafter that we could get our hands on. We wanted to capture the patients here and try and work out, can we find something within these patients that tells us what their disease trajectory is going to be? Um, and you'll see that we have in fact um, um, done that. So the patients were picked up on admission at that time. We didn't know what the disease course was going to be like, but we followed them. We sampled at as many time points as possible. And then we did this massive analysis of blood samples for uh, mediators in the serum, the inflammatory mediators that give you your cytokine storm, but also analyzing every single immune cell subset and its state of activation. As you can imagine, when you merge that with clinical data, we have a massive data set that we will be sharing uh, with the academic uh, community shortly. So we've done real-time immunological analysis. Most people don't do this. They sample, freeze down, and then they analyze the immune response later on. We have found that if you do that, you'll miss the main point of this disease. And so what you're seeing here, you would not see 
in uh, archived frozen samples. Patient details. This was tricky because it's all done retrospectively. So you'll see in a minute that we had patients with mild disease, moderate disease, severe disease. And the trick was to get these um, matched as closely as possible, which we've done. We did have a problem with our controls in that it's very hard to actually bleed healthy people during the time of a pandemic. But fortunately, we found a number of our colleagues were of the right age range um, in the hospital, and I include myself in that bracket. These, this is the male-female split of patients entering a uh, hospital, and it's generally about almost two to one, male, uh, female to male, uh, male to female. So we, we have uh, reproduced the male dominance of this disease. There are also a number of comorbidities that have been associated with a severe outcome. Diabetes is one of them. Um, hypertension um, is another chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and malignancy. And you can see that in all the groups, um, those are represented right across the spectrum. So it doesn't seem that with a comorbidity, um, you end up with a more severe disease. You, you just end up with a disease that, that pops you um, into hospital. We also collected um, data on whether they had a positive nasopharyngeal test, which they did in 86 uh, approximately percent um, of the case, but 90% in our severe patients. And we also uh, collected complications that occurred in, in hospital like pulmonary embolism, kidney injury and mortality. And you'll see over here on the right hand side, our data fits with the global data that if you end up in intensive care, you have a 50% chance of uh, survival. So before I move on um, uh, to John in a moment, I just wanted to say that we have classified our patients based on a severity score of mild, moderate, severe. Our clinical colleagues helped us immensely with this. And it's basically split into the amount of oxygen they require to maintain the appropriate oxygen saturation. So mild, less than three liters, moderate, less than 10 liters and uh, severe greater than 10 liters. And also these patients are in the intensive uh, care unit. Now I'm gonna flick onto this next slide and show you the number of people it took to do this study. Um, and we'll come back to this at the end. This really was, uh, I hate to say the, the, the phrase, the one Manchester approach. A huge number of expert immunologists daily processing of samples at all times of the day. We collaborated with four hospitals in Greater Manchester, North Manchester, Salford, MRI, and Withinshaw, and huge teams of people at each of those um, sites. We needed bioinformatics um, expertise. We were supported by the NIHR respiratory TRC, which contains representatives from the BRCs across the whole uh, country who looked at our data and, and helped us sort of look at the next steps, plus critical collaborators. And so we are talking today, but this is an effort on a, on a global scale. And I'll now hand over to John. Thanks very much, Tracy. Just sharing my screen. Okay, <clears throat> so um, so I'm going to start off by uh, discussing uh, some of the broad features that we observed in the uh, peripheral immune response of the uh, patients that were recruited as part of this study. And I think broadly, as Tracy mentioned, there were there were sort of two key questions that we were interested in answering by looking at the uh, circulating immune compartment in these individuals. One was to assess whether the specific features of the immune response early after hospital admission that are associated with the eventual disease severity uh, that the patients are going to um, experience. And the second thing is, if we track the circulating immune response of these patients over time, can we identify immunologic parameters that ultimately track with patient um, recovery and I guess a good outcome uh, for the patient? 
And our overall goal in studying it, this is that we would be able to um, aid patient stratification uh, when patients initially come into the hospital. So maybe to um, support uh, drug trials, for example. Um, and the other thing that we were hoping to do is really reveal some novel underlying biology uh, of COVID-19 by understanding how the peripheral immune response is uh, developing over the time course uh, of infection. So <clears throat> we can actually look at the uh, overall global immune response uh, using hospital data. Uh, so uh, hospital differential, differential counts are taken upon admission uh, of the patients uh, into, the, into the hospital. Um, and these hospital differential, uh, differential counts um, use basically light scattering uh, to allow us to very broadly uh, look at immune populations. So we can't look at any, any detail here. We can't look at the activation state of the cells. We can't look at the function of the cells, but we can very broadly classify uh, the type of immune, immune cell populations um, that are there. So we can do an overall white cell count, which is basically looking at um, all of the uh, immune po immune populations, and then split these into, into very broad categories. So uh, lymphocytes, neutrophils, and monocytes. Um, so Tracy mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, um, but um, broadly our immune system can be split into two components, the adaptive immune system and the innate immune system. Uh, the innate immune system is, is very important in defending us against infection and also important in the repair process that occurs after the infection. Um, has been limited. Um, the adaptive immune system is, is potentially more important in protecting us against secondary um, infections. What we, can, what we can see in our COVID patients, if we split them into our mild, moderate and severe categories, is that actually looking on this very broad scale, we can't see a huge amount of difference um, in the immune compartment. Um, we can see maybe a slight hint of a decrease in lymphocytes in the severe um, patients and definitely in some of the moderate patients and uh, severe patients uh, there was an increase in uh, neutrophils compared to uh, the normal range so the gray here is the is the normal range of healthy patients <clears throat> monocytes again we're not we're not hugely um, affected at this very broad uh, scale um, one thing that we we can do is sort of investigate how the adaptive immune compartment and the innate immune compartment are uh, being altered in tandem. And one way that we can do this is by looking at the neutrophil uh, to lymphocyte ratio. Um, and what you can see when we, when we calculate this ratio uh, is that there does tend to be um, higher levels of uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio in the more moderate and severe, um, severe patients. Um, upon admission to hospital. So this maybe does suggest um, that there are some uh, imbalances in the uh, peripheral immune response in more severe patients. But I think the level of detail that we see on these hospital differential uh, counts isn't, isn't really enough to um, understand much about the underlying biology here. So as Tracy mentioned, <clears throat> what we did was we used flow cytometry in order to in a much more detailed way, investigate the, act the subtypes of immune populations and the activation states and function of these immune populations. Um, so we're, we're using 17 parameter flow cytometry. And what this allows us to do is look at various different markers that are associated with distinct immune populations and also their activation state. We can then create these plots here, uh, which are called UMAP plots. Um, and essentially this allows us to sort of visualize all of the immune populations that are, pre are present in the, uh, in the circulation. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of these immune populations today. I'm just gonna talk about these innate populations that I mentioned at the beginning. So neutrophils and monocytes, and then adaptive immune, adaptive immune populations, T cells um, and B cells. So one of the things that we can do is we can just broadly look at these kind of visualizations uh, to understand what's happening in our uh, patients. And I'm not going to go through this in a, in, a, in a lot of detail, but what you can see, um, particularly if you hear if, here, if we look at the severe patients, um, you can see that you have really a, a lot of these, a lot of these neutrophils um, and they're kind of shifted, which suggests maybe there's something different about their activation state. 
But you can also see that this, these T cells, you can actually barely even see this T cell compartment um, anymore in these severe patients. Um, additionally, in some of the patients, we even see new populations uh, of immune cells appear. So here we see this CD16 low population uh, of, of granulocytes appearing. So, so by looking at this very broad visualization, um, we, we can see that there are quite dramatic changes occurring to the overall peripheral immune response in our uh, COVID patients. So if we, uh, if we graph, graph this data, um, what you can see is, as was kind of apparent from that UMAP plot, is that um, T cells are decreased in uh, the severe, uh, severe COVID patients. In white here, we've got our healthy controls, green, mild, moderate, and then black, um, severe. And similarly, we see decreases in B cells as well. So this is a, this is a decrease in the frequency of the adaptive immune compartment uh, within the circulation. Um, at the same time as we're seeing these decreases in the adaptive immune compartment, we can see increases in the innate immune compartment. And you can see here that neutrophils um, increase in the, <clears throat> in the circulation of these severe COVID-19 um, COVID patients. Um, monocytes don't seem to be particularly um, affected. Um, and as, I as we mentioned at the beginning, what we're looking at here is more thinking about predictors of disease. So um, the data that I'm showing here is uh, the frequencies of these cells when the patients were recruited into, the, into our study. So early after they entered um, into, the, into the hospital. I'll show you some trajectories in a moment. So this is suggesting that the immune profile when the patients come, up, come into the hospital can tell you something about their final um, disease severity. Okay, so obviously one of the things that we can do is we can track what happens to these different immune populations over time um, and look at how this might be associated um, with outcome. So I'm just, I'm just gonna show you some moderate patients here. Um, so each of the patients um, is, a different, um, is a different color. And we've plotted the frequencies of T cells against the days of reported symptoms. So this is the um, day on which the patient reported that they first um, had symptoms um, of a coronavirus infection. And what you can see broadly over time in these moderate, um, moderate patients, uh, it's particularly evident here in this, this purple patient here, is that um, the uh, T cells increase um, over time as the patient begins to, begins to recover. If we look at the innate immune compartment, if we look at the neutrophils, you can see that you have a, a reciprocal relationship with the uh, innate immune, immune compartment. So you can see that as the T cells increase, the neutrophils, uh, the neutrophils decrease, um, suggesting that the overall peripheral response is heading back more towards uh, that which you see in a healthy uh, individual. But what happens in our severe, um, severe patients? So if we look at our patients that had a severe response, so ended up on high amounts of oxygen or ended up in ITU, um, what you can see is that broadly over time, they also have increases um, in, their, um, in their T cells. The crossed areas here uh, are when the patient was actually in, IT, in ITU. But if we look at our, uh, and similarly, um, if we look at the neutrophils, we can see that they have this same reciprocal relationship. So uh, the neutrophils begin to decrease um, as the T cells are increasing. Um, but if we look at our patients that had a poor outcome, so uh, these are two patients, one who actually was in ITU for very extended periods of time, um, and one, one patient who actually sadly, sadly died from the disease, um, you can see that these patients uh, didn't have recovery of their uh, T cell populations and had high levels uh, of neutrophils in the, in the circulation. Okay, so what does this altered T cell neutrophil balance mean in our COVID-19 patients? So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, T cells and B cells can be particularly important in developing, um, an uh, important in developing an adaptive immune response. And this is important in secondary uh, protection against the pathogen. So one of the things that we're interested in is whether these patients that have extremely low T cells might actually ultimately uh, develop a very different adaptive response and secondary protection. One thing I'm sure you've all heard a lot about is antibody production and T cells are really important ultimately um, in antibody production through their interactions uh, with B cells. 
And we've also looked at the B cells in these patients. I'm not going to go into any detail on this. But one thing that we have observed is that in a lot of our severe patients, so these are the black patients, and they actually have low numbers of switched B cells over time. And switched B cells are the B cells that are going to be very important in supporting um, antibody production. So this may suggest that in some of our severe patients, that because of this um, uh, low sort of adaptive immune response that's occurring, that they may ultimately not have as good secondary um, protection. And this is something that we're um, investigating. What do all of these neutrophils mean? So neutrophils are major producers of tissue damaging factors, things like reactive oxygen species, and also these DNA nets that they're um, able to produce. Um, and we know that neutrophils are really good at protecting you in, in infections, but also if they become dysregulated, they can become part of the pathologic um, process. It's already been shown that actually the serum from COVID-19 patients can trigger a lot of this netosis um, from neutrophils. And so it's possible that this enhanced neutrophilia might be actually contributing to the type of pathology uh, that's occurring um, in the lungs of these severe uh, COVID-19 um, patients. I think the other thing uh, that, this, is, that this, this balance is telling us, um, and which Lizzie's going to talk about in far more detail now, is Tracy mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, but um, obviously uh, during infection, tissues become inflamed um, and you start getting immune responses developing locally. And this involves recruitment of cells from the circulation into the, um, into the tissue to defend you against the, against the pathogen. But also what starts to happen is these inflamed tissues um, actually start to send out long range signals all the way back to the bone marrow. Uh, and the bone marrow is where um, these immune cells like monocytes and neutrophils are being produced. So they're being produced in the bone marrow and then coming out into, into circulation. Um, and so I think the other thing that these shifts in the circulating immune response are telling you is that there's actually long range signals going back to the bone marrow and potentially initiating a process which is termed emergency myelopoiesis, which is driving these increases in neutrophils um, and potentially functional changes in these cells in circulation. Um, and Lizzie's now going to go on to talk far more about how functional changes might be occurring in these uh, innate populations. Okay, thanks, John. I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so as John alluded to, they're these systemic signals that are sent out by the lung that affect the bone marrow. And what happens in infections is monocytes play a really, really key role, and especially in infections in the lung. So this cytokine storm that you've probably heard of, these cytokines become systemic. They reach the bone marrow and this causes mobilization of monocytes. So these monocytes differentiate from stem cells in the bone marrow. They leave the bone marrow and come into the bloodstream expressing this receptor CCR2. And these monocytes then il infiltrate the lung during infection, for example, during flu infection. And these monocytes and the cells that they differentiate into have got a really, really key pro um, antiviral response. So these are really, really important in targeting the virus and reducing levels of the virus. But what happens is when these aren't regulated properly and when this type of immune response isn't regulated properly, as Tracy mentioned earlier, when things don't get dampened down quickly enough, this can cause a problem. So although you need this response to clear infections, it needs to be switched off. And when this doesn't happen, this contributes to excess inflammation this can cause tissue damage, and this can also cause longer term problems such as fibrosis. So what happens with monocytes and COVID-19? There's some recent studies that have shown there's a really critical role for monocytes in COVID-19. Um, so this is a chest X-ray of a patient with severe COVID-19 pneumonia, and you can see these areas in white here, and these are infiltrates in the lungs, and this will contain a large number of immune cells. So it's actually your own immune system that's causing a lot of damage in the severe COVID-19 patients. And we know from these previous studies that if you look at the bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, so the fluid that you can collect when these patients have been intubated in severe COVID-19, there's an abundance of monocytes in the lung. And there's also an abundance of these, these cytokines, which are mediators that actually attract CCR2 monocytes into the bloodstream, sorry, from the bloodstream into the lung. And these monocytes, as well as the cells that they differentiate into, have this inflammatory fibrotic signature. And that's very characteristic of severe COVID. We also know from studies looking at post-mortem tissue from deceased COVID-19 patients, that there's an infiltration of monocytes into the lung tissue itself. 
And this isn't just restricted to the lung. You also get monocyte infiltration into the heart, the kidney, the liver and the muscles. And we think this is partially why um, these severe COVID-19 patients get a lot of problems in other tissues, especially regarding fibrosis after, um, even after they've recovered from COVID-19. So what happens with these recruited monocytes is that they can have different functions. So as I mentioned, these are recruited into the lung. They take part in this inflammatory immune response. They produce a lot of inflammatory cytokines to get rid of the virus. But if this isn't switched off, this contributes really heavily to tissue damage. But what monocytes can also do is play a role in tissue repair. So this usually happens after the inflammatory stage to kind of repair the, the damage and the things that have been caused from the inflammation. But if these tissue repair pathways aren't regulated either, this can contribute to longer term effects such as fibrosis. So we think these monocytes are playing a really key role in the tissue damage and pathology that's happening in severe, especially in the severe COVID-19. So what we wanted to look at, especially in regard to monocyte function is how these monocytes in the blood are altered in COVID-19. Can these changes actually tell us who is gonna go on to have a severe disease, who's gonna end up in ITU and what happens to monocytes during the disease trajectory? So when should we target patients for therapeutics that are directly aimed at specific aspects of the immune system? What we found is that a lot of these monocytes in the blood from COVID-19 patients have dysregulated expression of this cell cycle marker, key 67. So in health, in healthy people, monocytes in the bone marrow express a lot of key 67 because they're in cell cycle, they're proliferating. But when they leave the bone marrow and come into the bloodstream, they don't express key 67 because they're no longer proliferating. So you can see here in our healthy controls, our circulating monocytes have very, very low levels of key 67. But when we looked at blood monocytes from the COVID-19 patients, there was increased levels of key 67. And this actually tracked really, really nicely with disease severity so that in our patients with severe COVID-19, many of which were, all, all of which apart from one, um, were destined for ITU, the monocytes expressed really high levels of key 67. Um, and as John and Tracy's mentioned, this cross-sectional data is um, at the time point when patients have been admitted into hospitals. So this is before a lot of these patients have actually gone into ITU. When we looked at this cell cycle marker, key 67, against C-reactive protein, so this clinical indicator of information, there was a strong correlation of key 67 with C-reactive protein, and in particular in these severe patients with the black dots here. So this is um, a really strong indicator of inflammation and pathology. So these data indicate that key 67 could be used as a potential predictor to target patients that are destined for ITU and to stratify them for treatment. The most likely explanation for this phenomenon is premature release of monocytes from the bone marrow. So whilst they're still proliferating and whilst they're still expressing key 67, and this is a phenomenon known as emergency myelopiesis. And it's a phenomenon that's actually already been seen in other pandemics, for example, H1N1 influenza. So what we also noticed in these circulating monocytes that was also very profound was this reduced expression of cyclooxygenase 2, COX-2. So COX-2 is an enzyme that converts arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. So these prostaglandins are pro-inflammatory mediators. They accumulate at sites of viral infection to, um, to clear the virus and to reduce the viral load. But because viruses are very clever, they've adapted mechanisms to evade host immune responses. For example, hepatitis B is a virus that specifically targets this pathway and specifically blocks COX-2, reducing prostaglandin production and therefore enhancing viral replication. So it's a strategy the virus uses to actually enhance its own replication. Of note here, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, including ibuprofen and aspirin, also act directly on this pathway. They reduce COX-2, lowering levels of prostaglandins, and that's how they exert their anti-inflammatory function as painkillers. So we found that on circulating monocytes, we saw lower levels of COX-2. And again, this stratified very, very nicely with disease, disease severity. So in our patients with severe COVID-19, they had lower levels of COX-2 on their circulating monocytes. So these data indicate that COX-2 may also be an early predictor of disease severity. It could be used to stratify patients to determine who's gonna go into ITU and which patient should be targeted 
for particular therapeutics and also argues against the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories in COVID-19 infection, which could potentially lower levels of COX-2 even further, um, reducing prostaglandin production, which may potentially enhance viral replication. So we wanted to know not just what happens on admission, that was very useful for determining can we predict which patients are going to end up in intensive care, but we wanted to know what happens to these monocytes throughout the COVID-19 disease course. So we followed up the same patients through their hospital stays. Um, as you can see from this data here, the patients came in at very different time points during the disease course. This patient here came in at day three, for example, after exhibiting symptoms, whereas this patient here came in at, um, after two weeks of exhibiting symptoms. So there was a lot of variability with when patients actually became sick enough that they had to be admitted. And um, we've got the mild patients here in green that recovered and the severe patients here who ended up in ITU and what we found with key 67 this cell cycle marker in the monocytes it was high in all patients at admission even higher in the severes but it dropped very very rapidly regardless of disease outcomes so whether the patients recovered or not key 67 was a very early marker of severity whereas when we looked at cox2 throughout the disease trajectory we saw that in our mild patients who recovered COX-2 levels came back up to normal, so they normalized quickly, which really trapped well with recovery. Whereas our severe patients who stayed in intensive care, they stayed low throughout their intensive care treatment. So the most profound changes that actually came up from this longitudinal data, so following these patients up throughout their disease course, um, was in the levels of systemic cytokines. So we've spoken about cytokine storms this is what happen, um, happens during a lot of infections, um, including COVID-19. So there's a lot of literature showing that um, cytokine storms occur, which is your immune system going into overdrive, producing a lots and lots of these pro-inflammatory mediators. These don't just stay in the lung. These are released into the bloodstream. As John mentioned, these then reach other places such as the bone marrow, causing mobilization of cells. So there's this feedback and constant turnover um, from, from cytokines when this happens. So we looked at the levels of systemic cytokines in blood serum, and what we found that we saw an increase in cytokines that you would expect to be increased during a cytokine storm, for example, pro-inflammatory IL-6, but we also saw increased levels of cytokines associated with innate cell migration. So again, supporting a role for monocytes in this disease, um, including in, um, interferon induced protein 10, and monocyte chemoattractant protein one. And these are both molecules that are involved in innate cell migration. But what was really, really profound with these cytokines is these were high on admission. So these were high early pre ITU, and these are all severe patients. But once these patients went into ITU, these cytokine levels dropped. So we don't think cytokine storm is an effect that actually happens in ITU. We think that it's a very, very early event that happens in the disease and that the problems patients have in ITU is more to do with structural and physiological damage. So this indicates there might be a critical window for targeting immune responses, and that's going to be early after admission, not when the patients are in ITU. So to summarize, this enhanced key 67 on circulating monocytes and low COX-2 levels on circulating monocytes in COVID-19 may be used as early indicators to predict disease severity, predict who's gonna end up in ICU and to stratify patients for treatment. With the increased levels of key 67 being a cell cycle marker, we think this is because monocytes are being released prematurely from the bone marrow, probably due to these um, increased systemic signals and cytokines. So these are coming out super quick from the bone marrow. They're retaining key 67 expression. That can be measured on admission. And with COX-2, these levels are lower in monocytes. This may be due to the virus targeting this pathway directly to reduce prostaglandin production, to enhance viral replication, but certainly argues against the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories during COVID-19. So we know that systemic cytokines and this cytokine storm is an event that happens early. Um, this indicates there's a window of therapeutics which should be upon admission. Um, and putting this together, this profile of low COX-2 um, combined with high systemic IP10, so this interferon um, inducible protein 10, is actually a profile that we've seen before. Um, so in other studies looking at idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, 
um, which is a lung condition, a fibrotic condition. This is a phenotype that's seen in, in this condition. So it's associated with fibrosis and indicates that these severe patients might go on to have fibrotic problems later on, um, which we know is, is characteristic of COVID-19. So I'll hand back to Tracy now. So very quickly at the end, um, we like to think, so what? Um, Sorry. It, ooh, Lizzie. <laughs> Um, it's very rewarding as a basic scientist to be able to work on something that's clinically immediately important. Um, we now know that the disease is driven by the innate immune system. We've got a way of identifying patients who are likely to have a severe disease, disease trajectory on admission, which Liz has just mentioned. It's surprising that cytokine storm abates in ITU because most of the clinical trials have been focusing on patients with more severe disease, and it may be that they need to be given um, earlier. I think these recommended therapeutics, because we've defined mechanism, we would suggest a different range now of therapeutics, particularly including those that would inhibit neutrophils and their, and their toxic products, but also the, uh, the dysregulation of immune cell release from the bone marrow. Next one, Lizzie. So what next? We want to continue this. We want to maintain the team. Um, our patients are very heavily characterized and in collaboration with, with Insurance Salford, we'll be following up the long-term effects on the patients, not just their immune response, but uh, their mood and the impact that this has on their underlying conditions. We're associated with a vaccine trial and our, our, our emphasis now is to maintain this structure Circo, which I'll talk about on the last slide, um, so that we can turn rapidly to wave two, um, should, should it arrive. So I want to finish by thanking absolutely everybody. We've put the um, recruiters in here. We've put the tissue collectors in here, all of the clinicians, because it, it can't happen without each of its component parts. We are called Circo, Coronavirus Immune Response and Clinical Outcome and hopefully you'll hear more from us in the future. We're happy to stay and answer any questions um, that you may have. Thank you. So. I can see Dan. Um, organizing this, that um, I think that for the Premier League coming back and for someone which they got canned applause and the difficulty is <laughs> never a, a loud round of applause. I'm sure there are many hundreds of people in the audience who wish to applaud you because that was sensational. And, and before we move on to questions, I think really for those that have done clinical science and studies, in awe of the fact that the group of people you've pulled together and the speed you've moved at, because normally to plan a study like that for an elective disease study would take two years, three years, it would be someone's PhD and consume a large chunk of their life for a long time. So I'm absolutely astonished by the data collection analysis, the ability to get the appropriate ethical permission and move forward. It, it is awesome. It is, you know, the, the stuff that would take many years. And it's, it's a, a testament to a one Manchester um, breaking down of barriers, because many of those silos we've broken down to make working collaboratively between multiple hospitals and the university better. And that science is about teams. And that's a tremendous team you've put around, together around the country. This isn't just all about, and I'm sure Tracy will be the first to admit this, about great chief investigators. It's about that team you build around you. So uh, tremendous, I'm very impressed. I intend that we go on beyond 4.30. I understand that some people will need to leave us. Um, but Tracy, you must have uh, read the headlines in the Daily Mail today. 50 pence a day pill to cure COVID, conquer COVID. Or the Daily Express, five pound COVID wonder drug saves lives. I'm sure a lot of our audience would like to know you, Lizzie, um, John's perception on the, the headlines this morning. And maybe talk, give a bit of background and relate that to your work. I think that 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 tracks with uh, Dan's question that he put um, online about dexamethasone, and they are uh, very promising results. 
they, they work for a significant um, proportion of patients, but there is a larger proportion that it doesn't help. So I think we need a multi-pronged approach. Um, the dexamethasone trial, they actually gave it earlier. So we're, that would fit with, with our data. Um, and I, I think that a lot of anti-inflammatories would work if only they were given when the patient was on admission to hospital. What we're doing is you're waiting too long um, and you end up with a disease that's more damaged than, than viral. So I, I think there's a number of things that could work earlier, such as the neutrophil things we were talking about, um, um, and also anti-TNF, anti-interferon gamma. We just need to do the trials earlier. Uh, so I, I think, of course, you're absolutely right. I think the calculation is that for every, if you're in the critical care community patients, you have to treat 15 patients to save one life. And in the patients with, with moderately severe disease, it's, 25 patients need dexamethasone. So sadly, it's a very important and encouraging data, isn't it? But it's mm. a long way from conquering. Yes. Um, so that, that's very good. Do you want to talk a little bit more then about the other, and, I, and you share this out as you wish, Tracy, the other therapeutic options you foresee, these dr other drugs that you think may have a place in for early intervention? I think one thing that, that's, that's been missed is targeting neutrophils. Some of our patients with severe disease and those that died had 90% neutrophils um, in their blood, which is screamingly high. I don't know whether, John, do you want to uh, talk about possibilities there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 can, I, can, I can comment briefly. I think, I think one of the challenges uh, with neutrophils is um, there's, a, there's a number of drugs that have been tried in other disease settings and they've not been particularly um, successful, and so I think I think I think a lot of uh, companies have, have been quite uninterested in targeting neutrophils. But I think I think here you can see that in this, some of the patients they do have huge frequencies of neutrophils in the circulation, and so it would make sense that if you could find ways to target them, uh, it could well affect uh, disease pathology. Um, I mean, Tracy kind of highlighted a little bit at the end. I think there are a number of um, a number of therapeutic um, options already available. Um, Things like targeting complement um, might be a possibility. This this is one of the factors that drives neutrophil um, neutrophil activation, or even potentially targeting some of the chemokines that are important for neutrophil neutrophil recruitment. And so, just I'll, I'll come to some of the other questions. I'm just extending that though, in in terms of target other neutrophils, because there are established anti TNF drugs that are potential targets. I'm not so conscious, maybe correct me, John, about licensed drugs that target the neutrophil. And Tracy, what about the anti-TNF and how do they fit into your data? Could, could I make one, one brief comment? So yes, I think, I think one issue is that there are less, less licensed um, drugs to target, to target neutrophils. But I, I, think, I think the other point would be that actually some of these, um, some of these drugs that uh, broadly target cytokines will um, affect neutrophils as well. So, for example, things like anti-TNF, uh, anti-GMCSF, uh, these are cytokines that are also important in neutrophil function. And so they may well also be one of the populations that's targeted in this in this setting. I think one of the problems with neutrophils in general is they're quite understudied because Tracy alluded to this at the beginning, but unless you look in fresh blood samples, it's very hard to study neutrophils because they're one of the cell populations that um, dies when you freeze down um, samples and so I think for this reason it's actually been quite difficult to uh, study the function of these cells and one of the things that we're actually continuing to do now um, is actually study the function of these cells in our fresh our fresh samples. There's an important question um, online because we are trying with our data to to make a difference uh, going forward and, uh, and to have uh, an impact and somebody has asked in clinical practice, how easy is it clinically to check for P67, COX2, T cells? And I think it's, it's absolutely feasible. And what we're going to be doing is getting together a protocol that would, you, you know, you have, you have the technology to do that. P67 is used routinely in the staging of uh, tumors. I'm not familiar with uh, about COX2. And if, if you can detect lymphocytes, then you should be able to pick up pick up T cells. So we are going to try and get something together uh, 
ratified by our clinical colleagues that could work. And you, what about um, Lizzie? Do you want to mention something about COX two? Because somebody asked whether the COX two had gone down because of they were on treatment. Yeah, I was just about to answer that, actually. So I think that's one of the things we were really worried about in the early stages when we were seeing that a lot of the patients had this reduced COX-2. So we thought this might be a really interesting mechanism by which the virus was targeting the immune system. But given that the NSAIDs directly, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories obviously directly inhibit this pathway, I then thought well, maybe actually they've all been put on anti-inflammatories. So we've gone back and gone over all this clinical data with a fine tooth comb. And a lot of these patients aren't on those types of anti-inflammatories. They're on a real mixture of different things. Some aren't on anything, some are. But in all cases, there's lower COX-2. And actually, COX-2 is one of the things that, although it's stratified, um, it tracks with the disease severity, even in the milds, it was noticeably lower in all patients with COVID-19. So it would be, it would, it, we did kind of weed out the patients that were on drugs that would affect COX-2. Um, and we don't think that that was why it was low in the in the uh, viral disease. We were um, also given blood from patients who were on uh, dexamethasone in, in our study. So we're going to be going back and looking at those. Um, Alison Gurney has asked a question, which is very good. Um, um, why does dexamethasone if effective in severe disease if it's not a cytokine storm? I guess we think of anti-inflammatories as neutralizing inflammatory cytokines when they may also be uh, reducing pro-fibrotic cytokines as well. So we always look for the, the usual suspects, TNF and interferon gamma and IL-6 and show they go down. But this disease is highly fibrotic and it's possible that dexamethasone is also down-regulating cytokines and chemokines that support support that but um it's it's sort of people analyzing looking one way and then not looking back um back the other way so tracy can i just step in there have been questions about antibodies lots of people are having their antibodies measured and, and discussion about the the what it tells you about immunity. You've not mentioned antibodies. Do you want to relate your findings to, to the antibodies we're hearing so much about? We haven't, um, we, we've sort of shown you the tip of the iceberg and we'd, we'd be happy to talk to anyone who wants more detail and we are going to be making the data publicly available for people to analyze. Um, antibody was very low in severe patients. Um, something that John alluded to earlier you need T cells to help you make antibodies from B cells. And if the T cells are low, you won't have the help to provide the B cell response. We have now got um, a kit internally that we're testing for a company. We're also developing an antibody kit ourselves, which seems to be working quite well. So another one of our colleagues, uh, Madvi Menon, couldn't be with us today because she's moving house. Um, but she has done all the B cell prof profiling and it seems that um, the B cells have uh, an exhausted phenotype. They have a phenotype where they might be producing auto antibodies. But I think collectively the data shows in severe patients, they don't mount a very good adaptive immune response. And so the T cells and the B cells remain quite low. It is possible, and we want to follow those patients up, the ones that survived, that they haven't mounted, they haven't got antibodies that are long lasting. And so we're going to follow them up long term and get them back in and, and have a look at what's going on. So we have fully analyzed all of the B cells and, and the antibody. I don't know if any of the others has something to add to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, don't have, I don't have a huge, huge amount to add other than just to say, and I, I think this is something that's obviously being reiterated repeatedly in studies and in, in the press. One thing that we also still don't know is really what antibody levels mean in protection against this, um, in this virus. And we also don't know how rapidly antibody is going to wane in, um, in individuals with different severities of disease or even asymptomatic, um, asymptomatic individuals. I think our data at the moment would suggest that, and, this in um, Tracy, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think I just would, would suggest that maybe some of the mild and moderate patients are the ones that are going to be developing the better um, yeah. antibody responses. 
and are likely to potentially be therefore more protected against the um, against the virus. But I think only following the patients up is going to allow us to really address this. Okay, then would one of you like to talk to the, the relationship to age and how you how the the immune system evolves with age and how that relates to your observations because that's the striking thing one sees in the epidemiology of the disease apart from the comorbidities is the impact across the generations i think um as you age um there's several things that happen to your immune system um your ability to recognize a range of things narrows somewhat. So it may be that they simply don't recognize um, um, the virus. But what I think is the difference in the elderly is the kinetics. If you mount an immune response too slowly, your viral load will go up logs. So when you finally mount an immune response, it's to a greater viral load. But there are many, many, many reasons why. I mean, um, the elderly might be more susceptible. Their epithelial barriers, for example, or, or their vascular barriers may be a bit more leaky. Um, guys, do you want to add to that? Well, just with the, um, there's a phenomenon known as inflammaging as well. So it's slightly more complicated in that it's not just that the immune system in older people is just prone to being more inflammatory although it is kind of predisposed that way as tracy said it doesn't actually respond proper as as well as it does in younger people to viruses so not only do you get this kind of slow response it's then sort of pre-programmed to be more inflammatory than it should be as well um, and this is why older people are more prone to getting autoimmune and inflammatory disorders. So we think that this is also contributing to why we get this kind of hyperactive immune response, which is causing the damage, the sort of early damage to the tissue and the pathology. I guess one thing is they might have an imbalanced adaptive and innate immune response because we know a lot about how uh, the adaptive immune system sort of wanes with with age, but we don't know much about the innate immune response. And if this is innate driven, then they will get a worse outcome. So there's lots of good questions. I, I see that Tim Ward's just asked a question about the impact of chemotherapy and whether there is negative, in, what's perceived as negative impact on the immune response may actually be an advantage should you get COVID. I don't know whether you feel confident to comment on that, anybody, or whether there are some of the other data from the large registries of patients on immune modulators, like the TNF drugs or the checkpoint inhibitors, and whether we know anything about the effect on um, morbidity with COVID and co-infection. I think we're sort of, people are uh, analyzing the data at the moment, and I, I just have a few um, you know, comments that I've heard for example, in the rheumatoid population, um, the anti-TNF treated group may not have experienced the same hospitalization rate as those on other inhibitors. So we can, we can learn from systemic lupus erythromatosis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, asthma, all of these treatments that they're on we can now look at those communities and say, you know, did, did that group uh, fare better and and that's perfect for all of our stratified medicine cohorts that we have at Manchester we can just so I know that Anne Barton is going back and contacting them the anti-TNF I can say this because I'm a scientist there's a lot of politics in what drugs go forward in clinical trials um, and anti-TNF is sort of on the back burner but but it is being done um, can't remember where, but it's not in Manchester. So there is a trial to start, but not enough patients at the moment. And do I sense that frustrates you? I've been quite amazed at the politics. Um, yes, it, it, it is. Well, it sort of saddens me, really. I think more than more than anything, because um, you know, working together. I, I guess it's it's the pharmaceutical companies you know trying to make make their money and you get embroiled in all all of that um most people work really well together some people prefer to go it alone 
um, but it but it has been a little bit frustrating. And I'm, I'm conscious we're now 11 minutes over time. I want to wrap, wrap up shortly. There are lots of good questions, but I think earlier on we had one about the vaccine and vaccine development. And do you want to speculate on the value, how, how, how vaccines are going to be, obviously apart from infection in, in judge's success, have you had a chance to see any serology, so any bloods from patients that have taken part in studies so far? Is there anything you can say between you about? The I can, I can start, and John could probably um, finish that. We have had three lots of MERS coronavirus. We've had at least two waves of SARS. Now we're on to SARS-CoV-2. We haven't even got vaccines for the first two yet. Um, we're trying. Um, there are trials going on. The trouble is these viruses, they are RNA viruses, and when they replicate, they make little errors in their genome. This one's not as bad. Flu does this a lot. It mutates, and so any vaccine you make suddenly becomes uh, you know, obscure. We are involved in a vaccine trial, actually, which uh, John could talk about. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much I don't know how much I can talk about, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I think, I think um, just going back to just going to back to back to vaccines in general. I think um, I think obviously there are a lot of complexities in developing a vaccine to this type of virus, and so I think one thing that is really important is all of the immunophenotyping and basic mechanisms. Uh, looking at actually the disease itself, because I think as already is apparent from uh, the, the dexamethasone results that have occurred, I think the most rapid way that we're going to be able to deal with this disease is by um, learning what therapies actually um, actually work. I think this is a much more surefire way of dealing with the of, of dealing with the disease because I think vaccines are always a little bit of a shot in the dark, particularly in these type types of infection. Um, what I would say is that yeah, Manchester is getting involved in. Um, a vaccine study of, uh, I think, uh, a potentially quite, quite uh, innovative, um, innovative vaccine. Um, so, uh, kind of watch this space. It's something that we will be working on. Can I just add something at the end there? So, with the um, with the vaccine and in terms of how well it's going to work, to a degree, there's a few things that we just don't know. We're going to have to wait. And one of the key things here is going to be how long you retain these antibodies, and um, because obviously that's a waiting game to see do we keep. Um, antibodies that will target coronavirus for a few weeks for a few months um for a year for a lifetime we don't we're just going to have to wait and see a bit so that's going to be a key key question is how long we have this antibody response um are we going to have to get vaccinated twice a year three times a year once every two years so even if it does work it may need to be something that's kind of given fairly regularly I think I think the other the other thing actually to say is everyone's very obsessed with the antibody response but also actually your um, memory T cell response is very important in protecting you against secondary infection. And I think we're still not clear on the relationship between antibody and those memory T cell responses that's kind of optimal for protecting against these types of infections. Good. It's um, 15 minutes over time. I just want to thank everybody. Um, I want to thank, thank, first of all, Jane Crosby, who's the person who you've not seen, who's done an immense amount of work in drawing all this session together. So I'm very grateful to Jane for her help. But Tracy, John, Lizzie, uh, great start. I, I fear we're going to be inviting you back before the end of the year to update us on your findings because this is so rapidly changing. Um, but really, uh, sensational start to the, to the programme. We've now opened registration for the second seminar, which is in a fortnight's time on the 1st of July, which is um, on COVID, uh, current and future approaches to diagn diagnostics and therapies, which I'm sure will pick up on some of the themes that we've touched upon today around early detection of the vulnerable patient and the different therapeutic approaches and medication that may be used. So with those comments, I really want to thank everybody um, for their paying their attention, for all the positive comments and questions we've had, and reiterate that Alex delighted to receive suggestions for future speeches and speakers and topics to mask seminars at healthinnovationmanchester.com. Thank you all very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.